So it is my pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the day, uh, Siobhan Smith from the University of Otago. Uh, I think I actually managed to pronounce it right for once. Um, so Siobhan has over 15 years experience working in libraries and museums. As manager of the University of Otago Research Support Unit, she has overseen the development of services in bibliometrics, the institutional repository, journal publishing, research data management, and works closely with the university's copyright and open access manager to advocate for open access. In 2020, Siobhan completed a capability framework for researcher facing librarians to support professional development and recruiting. Now, this is a pre recorded talk again, so bear with me as I swap my sharing. I have the most stable internet out of everybody on the committee, so I drew this straw. Tēnā koutou, ko Siobhan Smith toko ingawa, ke te wharewaranga o Otago, o he mahi ana. Hello, my name is Siobhan Smith and I work at the University of Otago. Thank you for inviting me to present One Intrepid Librarian's Journey into Algorithms. This is a story of how I learned a lot about algorithms, their strengths and weaknesses, by exploring the citation categorization of Cite.ai and Semantic Scholar. AI, machine learning, process automation and robotics are no longer the future. These technologies are impacting on many aspects of our lives private and public. Scratch the surface of any academic library and you will find examples of these technologies in use, including Matthias, we appear to have lost the audio. search and relevancy ranking. What has sometimes been coined information skills for the fourth industrial revolution, librarians have been expanding information literacy into the realm of algorithmic literacy. When I think about algorithmic literacy, I am very much influenced by the authors Michael Ridley and Danica Polit Potts, who wrote Algorithmic Literacy and the Role for Libraries, and also the author Ryan Cordell, um, who wrote the report Machine Learning Plus Libraries. and pull it pots. One of the first things that is obvious is that algorithmic literacy is not simply the ability to write algorithms and is not just the domain of computer or information science. Indeed, the first step to being literate with algorithms is to recognize that an algorithm is present. But it's even more complex than that. Algorithmic literacy is the skill, expertise and awareness to understand and reason about algorithms and their processes, recognize and interpret their use in systems, create and apply algorithmic techniques and tools to problems in a variety of domains, assess the influence and effect of algorithms in social, cultural, economic and political contexts, and position the individual as a co-constituent in algorithmic decision making. So algorithmic literacy means understanding that both algorithms and data sets are not neutral or objective. Algorithms are computational systems that come laden with their creators' biases and oversights. 
and data sets are constructed by humans to meet particular ends, whether social, political or academic. Librarians want to help users become more skeptical of the text and images they find online. We are all familiar, I'm sure, with the notion of the deep fake. We want to help them evaluate the veracity of AI in email generated sources. And that is because we believe that careful assessment of such materials gives users powers to use them responsibly and effectively. The following is a real example of where I have been working with Associate Professor Martin Tollick to precisely do that evaluation and careful assessment of new tools that have come to support researchers with citation classification. The two tools in question are Cite.ai and Semantic Scholar, and in many ways they are fairly standard databases that allow you to search for publications and also give you citations to those publications. Their point of difference, however, is both use algorithms to categorise the citations. In the case of Cite.ai, they are categorised as supporting, mentioning or contrasting, in other words, disputing. For Semantic Scholar, they are categorised as highly influential and they also, cite, they also classify according to citation type, for example, cites results, cites methods or cites background. The obvious advantage of using an algorithm to do this is scale. It's probably quite easy to look at a couple of citations, but when we're talking hundreds or thousands, having an algorithm do it for you is quite useful, especially if you want to get a quick sense of whether that publication is well thought of, but also in terms of citations to your own publication about making more nuanced narratives about the impact of that paper. A critique of current practice, 10 foundational guidelines for autoethnographers is a paper written in 2010 by Associate Professor Martin Tollick. In 2020, in order to celebrate 10 years of this paper's influence on autoethnography, he undertook a research project to assess all the citations to it. This was a golden opportunity to work with an academic to look at the citation classifications of Cite.ai and Semantic Scholar and to compare them to the actual academic who wrote the paper's assessment. Martin agreed to be part of this research and together we worked through all the data in 2020 and early 2021. Sadly, I don't have enough time to go into the methodology or a lot of the results, but there is a story that I wish to tell that highlights how librarians can help with algorithmic literacy. Now, it's important to understand that whether it's a algorithm or a person doing the citation classification, that there are potential biases or assumptions at play. These could include the following. Assumptions that formal influences are always cited and that informal influences are never cited. That citations are unbiased. That citation culture is uniform across disciplines that high quality scholarship will gather more citations, that the cited material has been read and accurately described, and that the number of times a paper has been cited is a good proxy for impact. And in terms of doing this citation assessment and classification using an algorithm, there are even further questions that you need to ask. Can miscalculation have unintentional effects? And how are miscalculations identified and corrected. What demand is there for adding this type of context to citations and could it be abused? And are we conflating negative or disputing with bad? And who is training, checking and moderating the algorithm? And is that algorithm or just reinforcing already known biases such as the Matthew effect? And how does it account for different discipline citation practices, publications where English is a second language, cultural differences and how influence is expressed and so forth. So now let me tell you of a story of man versus machine, or perhaps more accurately, man versus algorithm. There were a number of citation classifications that were different between Martin and the algorithms for Cite.ai and Semantic Scholar. So one of the things we explored was how to challenge 
those algorithms, ask for an explanation, potentially ask for a change. With Semantic Scholar, we were unable to challenge at all. They allowed you to send recommendations for corrections of the metadata, but there was no process for asking for a correction in terms of the classification of a citation. Cite.ai were a little bit better in the fact that they did have a process for challenging a classification. So Martin and I proceeded to challenge some of the classifications. One is particularly noteworthy. There was a publication that Martin was adamant supported his paper. However, site.ai felt that it was just mentioning. After requesting a assessment of that classification by site.ai, the answer came back that they were satisfied the algorithm got it right, that the correct classification was mentioning. But it just so happened that I knew the author of the paper that was citing Martins. So I actually got in touch with the author and asked them for their opinion. And they agreed with Martin that their citation of his work was absolutely supporting, was more than simply mentioning. So we returned to site.ai and requested another assessment of that classification, this time stating that not only did the author of the publication being cited felt that it was supporting, but now we had the author of the publication doing the citing saying that it was supporting. However, in spite of this, the answer from site.ai was still no. We have looked at it we believe the algorithm has it correct. So what does the story illustrate in terms of what we learned from this process? The first thing to note is that we didn't always agree with the citation classifications provided by the algorithms of Cite.ai and Semantic Scholar. But for me, it also highlighted confusion around the idea of what is explainable AI. Explainable by who, to who. I found that when Martin was telling me why he classified a citation the way he did, he was able to clearly and convincingly articulate his reasons why. Did the man always agreed with them? I could potentially search for biases in his decisions, but the why was very clear. Site.ai and Semantic Scholar didn't provide the why. I could see what they were classifying. I could see how they were classifying, but why did they get the result that they did? And so it makes me think about what is a good or satisfactory explanation? What does explainable AI mean to our users who are making decisions from these tools. And this leads into the next point, that it was difficult to challenge or change the classification. We saw that with Semantic Scholar, there wasn't even a process in which to challenge that classification, at least for site.ai, they had a process and they explained what that process was. Again, the what and the how were quite clear. The why, was still missing. And the real big picture question for me is around this idea of source of truth. Who really is the source of truth? Is it an algorithm? Or is it the author of the publication being cited? Is it the author of the publication doing the citing? Who do we believe in this particular instance? And I I'm really getting interested in research around that kind of human versus algorithmic judgment and whether people tend to believe a judgment when it comes from an algorithm over and above that of a human. And what does it mean when that human is potentially an expert? Does that then reverse? All of this experience and all of this research and all of these questions are really important to teaching algorithmic literacy. So to bring together everything that I've spoke about in this presentation, I want to finish 
with these four observations which I have gained from participating in this project. The first observation is that algorithmic literacy is a complex set of knowledge and skills utilised to examine algorithms, data and outcomes. As mentioned earlier, this is not just something that is the realm of people working in computer science and mathematics, and it is certainly not simply the ability to write an algorithm. I also believe that librarians are well positioned to support the development of those knowledge and skills, that our that our experience in teaching information literacy translates very well to algorithmic literacy. Algorithmic outcomes are not immune to biases or assumptions that plague human decision making, and I think it is really important to be prepared to challenge them, or at least question them. And most importantly, never outsource your critical thinking. Thank you for the opportunity to present. I just want to do a shameless plug right here at the end for another project I've also been a part of, and that's the development of the IATL Research Impact Things. These are 11 self-paced tutorials that you can do on topics such as uh, traditional metrics, bibliometrics, alternative metrics, responsible evaluation of research, and so forth. It is useful for both new professionals just starting to support researchers in this area, but also for those of us like myself who have been doing it for a while but just need to brush up. I would really love it if you could go and check it out and if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me about it. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and that it's piqued your curiosity, if nothing else. I am more than happy to answer any questions, either now or if you prefer, flick me an email. Ka kite. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Suddenly I have technical issues. Thank you very much for that, Siobhan. Uh, very much appreciate your presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, I always find it disturbing when uh, algorithms, uh, well, because they're written by people who look like me, they're biased towards people who look like me. Um, so I'm just having a look to see if we already have any questions. Um, so, in fact, we do. We've got one question already. And everybody else, if you have any questions for Siobhan, please remember to pop them into the Padlet. So, um, how do you think that your work aligns with the idea of responsible use of metrics? That's a great question. That is a really great question. And um, my first thought is that and it's that kind of black box thing and that one of the one of, for me one of the kind of central parts of using metrics responsibly is is transparency and that um partly what i'm what i was trying to do was pull those layers back on some of these algorithms that have been used and to see if i could get more transparency there um and it's actually very interesting how they're not very transparent um, which means that I'm not a throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of person but I do think it warrants care if you're going to use these particularly in that kind of metrics where you, where you say look I've got you know so many highly influential citations and semantic scholar or so many and, and I think I can see like in the future that those kind of um Th those, those kind of things are going to start appearing, particularly if there's widespread adoption in certain disciplines for these tools. Uh, but I think it is incredibly important that, that they continue to be transparent. That's according to this tool, and that's according to that tool's algorithm. And so therefore, you know, there is space to say that this is not a universal truth, because that's one of the things that I think is really important is what is that source of truth? The, 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 just because it comes from an algorithm doesn't mean it can be any less biased. And you know, as I said in the um, in the presentation, um, with um, you know, with Martin, you know, he's he's a person. He'll have biases in terms of how he was 
assessing, but because he was a person, we were able to have that relationship, that korero between us, that I could see where his thinking was. And I felt a lot more certain in understanding why he got the result he did than why, say, Semantic Scholar or Site.ai got the result they, they did. And I think as, as algorithms become more and more complex, sometimes I think even the people who write them won't actually really understand why they get the results that they do. So it's just... It's just about being incredibly careful and asking those, those kind of questions and being transparent if you're going to use these tools in the kind of um, research impact kind of realm. Um, yes, I uh, coincidentally, well, I was watching an episode of QI last night and uh, they mentioned how many uh, object classification systems uh, say that lots of things are a giraffe. So these are systems that have been trained on random images from the internet. And they say lots of things are a giraffe. And that's not necessarily because lots of things are giraffes. It's just people post more pictures of interesting things on the internet than of boring featureless rocks and, and stuff like that. So if, if your training set is not great, then the classifications you get out of the end will not be great either. Um, now, unfortunately, we do not have uh, any more questions for you, but we there, there certainly have been a lot of comments about how interesting it was. So uh, I, I forgive people for that because I know that this kind of area with algorithms is, is very, very scary, <laughs> which is why I recommend just dive straight in with it. Just dive straight in. <laughs> Look, you've certainly made us uh, think about it and, and hopefully we will do some more thinking about it and apply a critical eye to the uh, use of algorithms. Yeah, because one of the things, and I think this is a point that's made particularly by the, the machine learning report that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is that, I mean, I've taken the view of us teaching about um, algorithmic literacy, but the flip side of this is libraries, you know, and this this actually um, may, may relate to things like, like the couple of, like the blockchain plus the, 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 the text data mining and that, as we grow our digital collections as inside out libraries and we start pu putting these things out there, libraries are going to actually be taking advantage of algorithms as means to package up and to communicate and to allow people to interact with. And so we kind of need to think about how we can do that ethically and transparently as much as possible and kind of practice what we preach on the other side. So I think that's, that's it's, a, it's definitely a really important space for libraries to be thinking in. Great. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Siobhan.